everybody. Welcome to this service of worship. I am the Reverend Sammy Evans. I serve as the pastor and head of staff here at the Stone Church of Willow Glen, and it is such a delight to welcome you all to this service. Uh, whether you are here in person or on Zoom or on Facebook, I hope that you feel the presence of God and the warm welcome of this community, uh, especially if you are visiting for the first time. We're so glad that you are here. I would bring your attention to uh, the inserts that is in your bulletin if you are present here in person. And then it's also at the very end of the bulletin um, online if you have the online bulletin. There are so many announcements and so many ways to get plugged in to the life of this community. So I would ask you to take some time either today or later this week to read through all of these. But I do want to highlight a few of them. The first is that today following worship, the Reverend Dr. David McCree, who's in the back, David, is going to be leading the adult ed class this morning right here in the sanctuary and also on Zoom. There's a special link on the website for adult ed. It's always there. Um, so make sure that you uh, check that out if you want to join either online or here. I also want to highlight that this is the first Sunday of Advent. Um, so I'm sure you've noticed that the sanctuary is just stunning. So a special shout out to the liturgical arts group and all of the folks who um, have who gathered this past week, especially to put up this behemoth of a Christmas tree, which is just stunning and really brings uh, the, the spirit of the, the season right into our, um, into our space. And so I'm thankful for that. Uh, then I also want to just highlight that the today worship service, um, the Advent today, today services, which are every Tuesday during Advent, begin this coming Tuesday, and these are going to be in person. So they are here in the sanctuary. There will not be a, um, an online option for this, so it will just be in the sanctuary throughout the season of Advent. And then um, the final thing I want to highlight is an opportunity for um, volunteering. And that is that we need some ushers throughout the Christmas season. And so if that is something that you would be interested in doing and learning about, uh, please check out the bulletin for how to do that. And then finally, for the Christmas flowers, there's a special insert, which I would ask you to check out. If you um, would like to give a donation in honor of a loved one, you can um, make, a, make that donation by December 12th in honor for the Christmas flowers. And that is all for me. Let us worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. Can one be homesick for something you've never known? We are homesick for the world, for the use of our prayers, for the end of suffering. Yes, we are homesick. For the joy of the We are homesick for the world God promises. God is here. God is still creating. We hope for a world where all are fed. We hope for a world with more bridges than walls. We hope for a world with wide open doors. We hope for a world with contagious laughter. We hope for a world where trees grow tall and creeks run clean. We hope for a world where all people feel safe at home, in their bodies, in the church, in their physical homes. We hope for that world. We long for that world. We are homesick for that world. So today we light the candle of hope because hope keeps our hearts alive so we may wait. May this light be a reminder that the wait will always be worth it. We are close to home. May we carry hope with us. Amen.
a kid and you get homesick at a sleepover or a summer camp, you call home and your parents come and get you. Sometimes that's what love looks like. Love bails us out in the same way when we call upon God to confess that we've messed up or forgotten something or overlooked the truth, God answers with grace. God answers with love. So let us confess today knowing that nothing could keep God from loving us. Gracious God, we find ourselves with two options every day. To stay homesick for the world you had in mind or to allow cynicism to win. Do we hope against hope or do we throw in the towel? Do we insist on a better world or do we assume it's impossible? Forgive us for the days when cynicism wins. Forgive us for numbing our homesick hurt instead of using it to fuel a better world. Kindle in us a hope that won't let go. Gratefully we pray, amen. Even when we throw in the towel, even when we give up on hope, God does not give up on us. We are loved. We are claimed. We are invited closer to God's home. So let us proclaim and trust this good news together. There is room for us in God's house, and nothing can separate us from that love. We are claimed. We are forgiven. We are welcomed home. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now, friends, I invite you to take the peace that you have been given and to share it with one another with different signs of peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Peace. Good morning, folks. Good to see you. Good morning. 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 Stars and God of our hearts, our days will pass, but your words will last. The earth might fade, but your words will last. Our memories might blur, but your words will last. The grass will wither, but your words will last. The sky could go dark, and your words would last. So as we listen today, help us to hold on to what will last. Help us to hold on to you. Gratefully we pray. Amen. The Old Testament reading today comes from Jeremiah, 30, chapter 33, 14 through 16. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called the Lord is our righteousness. The psalm reading is chapter 25, verses 1 through 10. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my Lord, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. And teach me, 
for you are the God of my salvation. For you I will wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. The word of the Lord. Really looking forward to the time when we all can sing in person here. Come on down, Eden, come on down. Hey, hi, so good to see you. Oh, come on, sweetheart, you can come. Hi, everyone, it's good to see you. Oh, it's so great to see you. I hope everyone had a great same Thanksgiving. As you can see, I'm still wearing my Thanksgiving outfit. I'm not giving up on Thanksgiving. It still, it still is November. I'm not giving up on it. Um, I'm so glad you're all here. How many people went away for Thanksgiving that went someplace else? Where did you, where did you go, Ezra, for Thanksgiving? Where were you at Thanksgiving? You don't know? Where did you just come from? You went on an airplane and you went where? Hawaii. You were in Hawaii. Yeah. Where were you? Fresno. Science camp. Oh, I'm glad they're doing science camp again. That's fun. I'm glad. So we are all, we are, some of us were at home. I was actually at home. And sometimes when you're, when you're gone away, and like Ezra, he was gone for a couple of days in Hawaii. Do you, when you go to camp, like camp, or you go someplace, aren't you excited, just as excited to come home? Aren't you glad to come home, right? 
You, you come home, no matter how much fun you had, no matter how much thing you when you, you are so excited to come home. That's because home is that safe place for you. It's a place where you, you know and you, ex, you know what to expect and you have all your things there. Well, today in Sunday School, we're going to talk a, a little bit more, and I'm going to just start it out right here, about what a refugee is. Does anybody recognize that word refugee? You might have heard it on TV or, yeah, you heard that word before. It's, you also hear the word immigrant. Have you heard that? Yeah, immigrant. So an immigrant is someone who is looking for a better life. So they come to a different country because they just want to move away, just like if you move to a different house, like you guys did. You guys moved to a different house. But when you're a refugee, that's a little bit different because those people have to leave because it's either dangerous or there's not enough food or there's a situation that they have to go to. So I have a little story here about somebody who's a refugee. And she is 14 years old, and her name is Shira. And here is a picture of her, if everybody wants to see. She looks pretty normal, kid, just like us, right? Pretty normal kid. And I'm going to tell you about her story. And these are in her words. I used to have a peaceful life, and I lived in an amazing home. I enjoyed the nature around my house and the food coming from the land. I woke up every morning to the sound of birds singing. But the brutality of the war forced my family to leave this house and to start the journey to be refugees. Since the start of our journey, we moved a lot in Lebanon, and I attended different schools. In the end, my family decided to be close to the border in Syria. We came to this place because we want to survive. My father is working as an electrician and is the only income for our family. All of my family are living in a tiny little one-bedroom house with a small kitchen and one bathroom. We are considered illegal because we don't have official documents. I am behind two years in school because of moving from one school to another. And I'm still doing very good in my school, and I continue to do that. I want to finish my education to help my family and other people that, that, that want to learn. I am really sad because of the unknown future waiting for me. Every day I wonder where I'll be tomorrow. Yes, it's an unknown future. Wow, that would be really hard, wouldn't it, to be that person? to not have that home because, and it wasn't because she left because she didn't like her home. She loved, sounded like she loved where she lived. So that's why as children of God and as members of Stone Church and of the members of the world is why we have to try our very best to understand other people that come into our country and how we can help them. And you know what? I, like I always say, you are the ones that are going to solve all these problems that all of us did because you are God's children, and you are going to take care of everyone. I just know. Let us pray. Dear God, please help Shakira and her family as they try to find a home for themselves. And to remember as we are cozy in our beds in our own home that there are others struggling and that we, we can think about how we can help them. Amen. All right. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth the stress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. 
Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life, and that day catch you unexpectedly, like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. So be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah, Ruth, John, and Nancy, send your Holy Spirit to rest upon and move among us in this time, enlightening us to your wisdom and guiding us in your ways. Let all voices but your own fall away and let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For you, O God, are our rock and redeemer. Amen. Having grown up in northwestern Pennsylvania, I can tell you how profoundly hopeful and joyful one feels when the trees begin to sprout their leaves. After a long winter, Sometimes, after not seeing the sun for several months, being weighed down by snow and ice and even sometimes mud, it just makes for an overall gloomy, hopeless season. So when those leaves sprout, you know you're not quite out of the woods yet because it could snow again in April, but you still know that you are on the cusp of something new. The experience is not as quite as profound here. I've noticed that most of the trees kind of lose and regrow their leaves throughout the seasons. There's never a time when they're completely bare. But there are some that do drop all of their leaves, right? One of those is um, my beloved persimmon tree, which many of you know that my relationship with this tree is a bit complicated. It's uh, the soft persimmon, so it makes a terrible mess if you do not tend to it, which I have, of course, learned the hard way. If you do not pick this fruit while it is still hard on the tree, it will eventually soften, fall down, and just smash everywhere. And not only that, but when the season really changes, all of the leaves fall off. And these leaves are big, okay? They are big leaves, and they cover a significant portion of my backyard. They choke out all of my succulents that live under it. Luckily, succulents are hardy. So every spring, when I first notice those little green sprouts, it does not bring me joy or hope for the changing of the seasons. It brings me frustration and a reminder that I will have to do all of that work once again. And I confess that I have more than once tried to curse the tree in the name of Jesus. It's biblical. He did it. I do have some good news to share, though. For I have experienced a shift in perspective. You see, for the past several years, I have taken off several branches of this tree, so it's become more manageable. I've also come to realize that there are many, many people in my life, um, people right here in this church, people who live on my block, who love persimmons. And so it actually gives me great joy in giving those away once they have started to ripen. And I also now have a leaf mulcher, It's like a little backpack, so I can go around and suck up all the leaves, and then I feed them to my worms, who literally, I mean, they plow through this leaf salad, like, in a week, okay? And finally, this is the first year that I planted a winter garden, cauliflower, broccoli, collard greens, and I was actually pretty worried that the the garden wouldn't get enough sun, because the winter sun is so low. But I'm noticing that because all of those leaves have fallen off, this, um, this brand new open uh, sun has, has occurred in my garden. So, when I read Jesus' parable, and he says, look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout those leaves, you know that summer is near. There is a part of me that is filled with hopeful and joyful expectation of the promise of new life and new growth. And then the other part of me, still looks upon this sign with some trepidation, perhaps some irritation of the work that it is sure to bring. I'm thinking 
that perhaps this is the point Jesus is trying to make with his parable. He says that when all of these things start, and the nations are in an uproar, you will know that the kingdom of God is near. And he says that with these signs, we should be moved to hope. In that hope, there's joy and anticipation of God's promises finally becoming real. This new life, this new growth that God has been promising for generations. But so also will there be a bit of consternation. For we must also know that with this coming kingdom, there will be work for us to do. Miriam Kaba, who is an abolitionist writer and activist, once shared in an interview that for her, hope isn't an emotion. It's not something that precludes feelings of sadness or frustration or anger. Instead, she says that hope is a practice. Hope is a discipline. Miriam says that in the world we live, it's easy to feel a sense of hopelessness, that everything is bad all the time, that nothing's ever going to get better. And sometimes it feels like that's being proven day after day. But she says that in the face of this, she chooses to think a different way, to act a different way. And she shares that she learned this from a nun who taught her that fundamentally hope is a discipline that we must practice day after day after day. And then when we do this, our hope can become something tangible something that is present in the here and now, not something that is on some distant shore, but something that we feel today. And this hope is something that can inspire us, but also challenge us. It's a hope that assures us and then stretches us. Engaging in hope as a practice, as a discipline, enables us to keep working in the face of adversity and violence. It enables us to stay focused on what is good and right and just when we are drowning in injustice. Because our hope is our instructor. It is our buoy. It is our revelation of what is actually possible. And there's one more thing that Miriam asserts, which I think is super important for us. She says that in her work, she chooses to take the long view. She says that she realizes she's just one part of this long story. And she wasn't there when it started, and she certainly won't be there when it's over. But rather than allow this to overwhelm her or lead her to some kind of nihilism, she's comforted by it, sustained by it, because she's free to see the work that she does today, the hope she practices today, she is able to see it as enough. So friends, I think this is super important for us, especially on this day, the first Sunday in Advent, when we begin to prepare for the birth of the Christ child. We always read a text like this one, because the season is not only about preparing for Christ's birth, but also preparing for Christ's coming again. They call this text a a little apocalypse, because it tells of the end times, when Jesus will come again to finish the work that he started. And about that day, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. So I always wonder, what are we, 21st century Christians, supposed to do with these words? What are we supposed to do with them 2,000 years later? He tells us to read the signs, to know when the time is near. Well, raging seas check. The nation's confused, check. Fear and foreboding, check, 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 right? But here's the thing. It has been like this many, many times before. This story did not start with us. It didn't even start with Jesus. The Christ child was born into a particular time in history. And his birth brought hope to an oppressed and downtrodden people, a people overwhelmed with the injustice around them. His life brought instruction, truth, and goodness. His death brought sorrow and despair. And his resurrection brought new life and new hope for all of creation. 
And since that time, my friends, empires have risen and fallen. Autocrats and kings have murdered the innocent in order to maintain their power. Colonizers and consumers, corporations and kingdoms have taken and taken and taken until the land and the people and the birds and the sea creatures and all of God's beloved children are used up. And I know that to some extent, this time feels unprecedented. But my friends, it is far from it. We exist during a tiny portion of human history, which is an even tinier portion of the history of the cosmos. And I can see how that might lead even the most optimistic person to despair or nihilism. But luckily for us, we're not called to be optimistic people. We're called to be hopeful people. The bit at the end where Jesus says not to get weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life, lest that day catch you unexpectedly, can read like a threat, but I think it may just be an invitation. Perhaps it is an invitation to respond differently to the injustice that is around us. Perhaps it is an invitation to practice hope. For hope instructs us to be rooted in the promises of God, the promise of new life and new growth, the promise of the kingdom that has come near. And it also challenges challenges us to get up and get to work. Hope, my friends, is a discipline. And in her blessing of hope, Jan Richardson calls for a hope not made of wishes, but of substance. Hope made of sinew and muscle and bone. Hope that has breath and a beating heart. Hope that will not keep quiet and be polite. Hope that knows how to holler when it is called for. Hope that knows how to sing when there seems little cause. Hope that raises us from the dead, not someday, but this day, every day, again and again and again and again. Let it be so for us this day, my friends. In the name of our triune God who creates, sustains, and redeems us all. Amen. that are polluted, and walls that are growing. You're clearly not home yet. So until we reach that promised day, until we make it home, giving what we can to make a better world matters. When we give our tithes and our offerings, we help build God's home here on earth. So with hopeful hearts, let us give in gratitude. Let us now receive our morning offering.
blessings you have given us year after year. Help us to wisely use the time you have given us. Lead us while we remain here on earth to serve you through all the people around us who are in need. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we trust that you are here, listening to these words, drawing us close, stirring hope awake in us. And for that, we are grateful. We are so grateful. We continue this day with hearts and minds of gratitude as we have celebrated a time of Thanksgiving and have now fully entered into the holiday season. We know that this year, time of year comes with a lot of joy and a lot of grief for so many different reasons. And so today we dare to name and acknowledge that before you, trusting you to hold us in it. Today, Holy God, as we begin the season of Advent and reflect on the theme for this Advent season, we name that we feel close to home, close to you when the choir sings, when the candles are lit and we see this chrismon tree up again, when we enter this space and someone knows our name. We feel close to home when our children are curious, when we find moments of true connection, when we are brave enough to be who you call us to be. However, God, even with gratitude for our close-to-home moments, we also recognize that buried deep within us, we have homesick hearts. And so we name those things before you today as well. We are homesick for a world we have not seen. We are homesick for a world where we realize there is enough for everyone. We are homesick for a world where oceans are clean, trees are green, and animals are not endangered. We are homesick for a life where days feel expansive and Sabbath feels possible. We are homesick for days where mental health is not stigmatized, time is not a commodity, and self-worth is not a scarcity. And some of us are homesick for some joy today. God, who never leaves us alone, we are carrying both hope and homesickness all at the same time. Hold these two sides of the same coin tenderly and fan the flame of both. For we realize hope is a gift and homesickness is a reminder. For each conviction, we give you thanks. And now with the confidence of children, we pray the prayer Christ taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
Christ, I invite you now to go forth into the world in peace and be of good courage. Hold fast to everything that is good and render unto no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, and honor all of God's children, remembering always to rest in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you, those you love, and for whom you pray this day and every day. Amen. Thank you.